The presidents of both America and Russia say they want a world free of all nuclear weapons to help make it a safer place. But even if they eliminate all their nuclear arsenal, what are terrorists and rogue states going nuclear? Is it too late to deal with that threat? My guests today on Hard Talk are two former senior American officials working in this field, Richard Burt and Richard Pearl. Richard Pearl, Ambassador Richard Burt, gentlemen, welcome to Hard Talk. Richard Pearl, so the mood music seems to be changing. America and Russia saying in July, look, we're going to cut our nuclear weapons substantially in about seven years' time. Are you in tune with this new thinking? You should be. I, I certainly think we should be reducing the number of nuclear weapons in the American arsenal, whether the Russians uh, do so or not. Uh, the days in which... Uh, American decisions on these matters had to reflect uh, the, the size and character of the Russian arsenal are long past. They went with the end of the Cold War. Ambassador Richard Burt, you worked in the State Department on arms control under Reagan and Bush Sr. At the time, uh, you had a very different po point of view. You didn't really want to see reductions in nuclear weapons. Why have you changed your mind? Well, no, I always supported the idea of reductions. I, I never supported during the Cold War the idea of, uh, of eliminating all nuclear weapons. And I, I know very, I remember very clearly that, that Richard Pearl shared that view at the time. But to use a maybe overworked term, uh, there has been, I think, a fundamental paradigm shift in international relations since the end of the Cold War. Uh, nuclear weapons, uh, I think, contributed to some degree during the Cold War to strategic stability between the United States and the Soviet Union. Our strategy of deterrence, uh, I think, was effective uh, at a time when our European allies were threatened by superior Russian conventional forces, but we no longer face those kinds of threats. As you in your, uh, in your prelude pointed out, the threats now are different. Uh, we are fighting two wars, but they are counterinsurgency wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, and nobody is talking about using nuclear weapons there. The threat now is the spread of nuclear weapons okay. to, uh, to third states and possibly nuclear terrorism. And there, I think the goal well, of nuclear elimination makes sense. All right, but you believe, don't you, that nuclear arms can be down to zero by 2030? Well, I can't give you a specific date. Uh, because there are many very difficult problems to solve in getting down to zero. But, uh, but the, a process needs to begin. It is underway. I think the two, uh, two largest nuclear states, Russia and the United States, okay. can significantly reduce their existing nuclear stockpiles. And then I think other countries can be brought into the process. But 2030, China, is, a good, 2030 is a year that has been associated with you, a date where you have said... 2030. Yeah, could we, be possible. what we are, what, okay. what we at Global Zero, uh, which is an international effort to seriously examine the problems of getting down to zero, have said is we think this is a feasible goal in 20 years. Okay. Richard Pearl, feasible goal in 20 years? No, I don't believe it is feasible. I think it would be foolhardy. Uh, for one thing, uh, we can't possibly hope to verify uh, a hidden nuclear weapon that might be. Uh, uh, possessed by a rogue state, potentially. Uh, for another, uh, uh, if the United States is uh, reduced to zero, if the United Kingdom and France are reduced to uh, uh, zero nuclear weapons, uh, that means that any country that can obtain a nuclear weapon is suddenly uh, in a very strong uh, position. Uh, that's an incentive to countries to acquire nuclear weapons in the first place. I think the idea of zero is nonsense, and frankly, I'm surprised, uh, uh, Rick, that you're prepared to endorse it. Well, Richard, when you put it in the terms that you did, and you call uh, this process foolhardy, I mean, obviously, there, and as I pointed out, there are some very serious problems that need to be resolved if you're going to get to zero, and verification is one of them. But I have to tell you, right now, countries have an incentive to acquire nuclear weapons. They are doing it now. 
and they are doing it in part because uh, the United States and Russia, India and China, Pakistan and others have acquired uh, nuclear weapons. The only way to go about this process in a reasonable, technically sound and politically safe way is a phased approach. We're not talking about a foolhardy rush to zero in a matter of a couple of months or a couple of years. We're talking about a 20-year effort. And I'd point out, you talk about the rogue state problem. No country has ever developed and deployed nuclear weapons without people learning about it okay. and, uh, and uh, making that very, very public. Okay. So the idea that somehow somebody is going to, in a hidden way, develop and deploy nuclear weapons yep. It's simply not <clears throat> going to happen. What we need to do is create an international consensus. Sure. We need to raise okay. the Let bar Richard Pearl on come nuclear in here. proliferation. Okay, Richard Pearl, so I mean, is his desire to see the world rid of nuclear weapons in a phased manner by 2030, is that foolhardy? Is that not an ambition you should share or would share? No, I don't share it at all. I think it would be uh, extraordinarily dangerous. You have to imagine the date in 2030 or whenever <clears throat> when uh, all countries that have possessed nuclear weapons are known to have possessed nuclear weapons deliver their weapons uh, say to the United Nations or destroy them in some uh, verifiable way. Uh, I would have a very difficult time believing that every nuclear country had in fact delivered every last nuclear weapon. I remember discussing this uh, with your great uh, Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher. Mm -hmm. And uh, she said people would cheat. Of course they would cheat. Uh, the premium attached to cheating successfully is enormous. Okay, so are they just uh, the practicalities emerges, then? Is it the practical, the <laughs> obstacles, practically speaking, which make you say what you do? Or do you, just, do you not think perhaps that it is in itself per se desirable to, to rid? It's a noble ambition. No, I, I think you can't separate uh, the, the, what Rick calls the difficulties, which I think okay. are impossibilities. You can't separate those from the validity of the concept. If you think the difficulties are overwhelming and the risks attached to assuming uh, universal compliance are as large as I think they are, then you reject the concept. And okay. saying that it's phased or saying it's going to take a long time doesn't solve the yeah. problem well, you of know, the there, concept. There, yeah. there, was a, there was a time when, and, and, it's, and, it's, and it's, it's still with us to some extent, when uh, it was argued that, uh, that we could never agree or never should agree to, uh, to a nuclear test ban and, uh, because uh, people would cheat. Uh, now most uh, nuclear experts and scientists agree that we could live with a nuclear test ban. In fact, the United States hasn't tested nuclear weapons for 20 or 30 years. I, I agree with Richard, the issue of the end game, uh, a problem that may exist 15 or 20 years from now, and that is verifying a global zero uh, situation, is, is, very, is, is very challenging. But that tell, but we have to compare that with the status quo. We, if we don't move on the nuclear arms control agenda, bring China, India, Pakistan, yeah. Israel, and others, in, let me finish my point, sure. into but, this process, <clears throat> we're not going to be living in a world with maybe eight or nine nuclear powers. In 15 or 20 years, we could be living in a world with 20 or 30 nuclear powers. But, we but, could be in a Middle East where Egypt, yeah, but, where Saudi Arabia, Turkey, but the point not Richard to mention Pearl, Iran that, the, right that now. That may well, okay. Rick, that may well be the situation we're in in 2030 with uh, a number of nuclear powers, including uh, Iran. We have North Korea already. Uh, what makes you think that uh, the North Koreans in, uh, in 2030 would turn over their last uh, nuclear weapon or that the I, Iranians I think, would do so? Yes. Or the Pakistanis? Well, that's, that's the point. That's the key point. Unless the international community takes realistic steps to create a consensus on these weapons, as we've done with other weapons uh, that, uh, that are not wildly de uh, widely deployed in other countries, uh, there would be no reason to go to zero. But if, uh, if North Korea yeah. is unwilling to agree to a regime that is, in, uh, that is transparent and verifiable, then we can't go to zero. If Iran actually deploys a nuclear weapon and sets off a chain reaction 
in, uh, of nuclear deployments in the Middle East, then we won't get to zero. That's why I think we're at a very important inflection point. And the question is, is, is it too late? I don't know. We're coming very close, though, to a period where unless we start making significant reductions in our arsenals, bring okay. other nuclear powers into the process, right, can... we will get further proliferation. Okay, Richard Pearl, I mean, there is a point there, isn't there, that you can't convince other countries to disarm, I mean, not just the official nuclear powers, but also the Indias, the Pakistans, the Israel, although officially it doesn't acknowledge that it's a nuclear power. You can't disarm such states unless the major powers like the United States and Russia, for instance, say, OK, we're going along that path too. Uh, no, I don't agree with that at all. In fact, I think the reality is almost the opposite. If the United States, for example, were to abandon its uh, nuclear weapons unilaterally, uh, would those allies of the United States who depend on uh, an American nuclear umbrella uh, be more comfortable, or might they consider that they should acquire nuclear weapons of their Richard, own? Richard, no, the, no the country big flaw has ever... In, the big flaw in Rick's argument is the idea that the decision to acquire nuclear weapons or to hide them uh, in the context of an arms control regime is a function of what the United States does or what uh, No, that's Russia not, does. It's not, it's not the United States, Richard. It's the international community. And the country that has relied the longest and to the most substantial degree on the American nuclear umbrella, i.e. Germany, supports Global Zero. They support the elimination of nuclear weapons. And, and I can guarantee you that if the United States and Russia are able to sign an agreement this year reducing their nuclear, their nuclear, their deployed nuclear forces and then move on and negotiate a further reductions agreement beginning next year, that the pressures on, on third parties, the Chinese, the Indians and others that join the process will be very strong. But okay, I, that's I, Richard, right. Richard Sorry, Pearl the, come in you, there. You, I mean, you, Richard Pearl but, has got a point there. U.S. and Russia account for 96% of Correct. the uh, world's nuclear weapons. So if those two make a deal, then surely they're pretty long coattails, aren't there, for the rest? Are, are, are the Pakistanis going to uh, make a deal in the face of uh, Indian nuclear weapons? You know, you as, as the part, Israelis as part, to make a deal in the face of Iranian nuclear weapons? This is a pipe dream. Uh, no, no, the, Richard, Richard. The notion the, of the, the international oh, Just let him finish community. his point, Ambassador Burt. Sorry, Richard, Sorry. Up. Sorry. The notion that the international community is going to persuade states that feel threatened and in some cases beleaguered uh, that their security is best served by abandoning their nuclear weapons, is, there's not a shred of evidence to support that. Well, actually, well, Richard Pearl, sorry, uh, Ambassador Burt, before you come in, I should just remind Richard Pearl that actually the Syrian ambassador in the United Kingdom are talking about this issue of Iran and the challenges it poses to the world as over its nuclear program. And the Syrian ambassador, Sami Khiyami, has said that Syria would actually play a positive role, use its influence with Iran, if the international community decides to promise to make the Middle East free of weapons of mass destruction. And he says, in particular, a country like Israel with a huge nuclear arsenal needs to destroy their nuclear warheads. So it does suggest there that uh, if you do take an initiative, that perhaps there would be a positive response. Oh, come on. Uh, Israel has a nuclear capability. Syria does not. Why should the Syrian ambassador not say that Israel should give up its nuclear weapons? And if it does, we will put pressure on uh, uh, Iran, which Syria is incapable of doing anyway. You don't go with well, that. Well, listen, I think, yeah. I, but I think you've hit a key point here. If there, if, there is, if there is the understanding and perception that there is growing support amongst governments around the world to reduce and eliminate nuclear weapons, you raise the bar for any single state to take a, a, to take a nuclear deployment decision. It isn't 100% a, a guaranteed, and by the way, if it doesn't work, this process is not irreversible. If it turns out that we fail in keeping Iran from going nuclear and, and Iran's neighbors then move forward to acquire their own nuclear weapons, then I have to tell you, global zero won't happen, and it shouldn't happen. But we have one last chance here, I think, to stop a trend that is gaining momentum in, 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 in international society, which is to acquire nuclear weapons. And the danger is, increasingly, that, like in the case of Pakistan, sub-state actors, terrorists, different yeah. uh, militant groups could acquire those weapons. I can guarantee you one thing. If one of those weapons is used 
anywhere in the world over the next 10, 15 years, the pressure for global zero will be irresistible around the globe. Richard Pearl. Look, Pakistan acquired nuclear weapons in the context of its uh, dispute with uh, India. India acquired nuclear weapons in the context of its concerns about both Pakistan and China. The, the idea that uh, uh, these countries, India and Pakistan, would give up uh, weapons that they believe are essential to their security because the United States and Russia had agreed to do so just doesn't hold water. But Richard, but I, nuclear Richard, weapons. Richard, Richard Pearl, I have to tell you, though, I've got a quote here from the Indian government. Its position is that nuclear weapons are an integral part of India's national security and will remain so pending non-discriminatory and global nuclear disarmament. So actually, that's... Yes, like, of course. In fact... Because in they fact, know the, perfectly well that it isn't going to happen. That's uh, exactly the, well, the Ambassador sort of posture Burt, the, one should the, expect. The Father, the father of the Indian nuclear bomb, uh, Dr. K. Subramanian, who uh, Richard knows and is, by the way, a supporter of our effort, uh, is very public on this issue. Uh, he supports uh, Global Zero. He supports the idea of eliminating all nuclear weapons because he recognizes that, in retrospect, the Indian decision to go nuclear uh, has not served Indians, India's national security interests. It's exactly what Richard said. It, it triggered a response by Pakistan, which is inferior in terms of conventional forces, and it is it is stale it is stalemated in India's conventional superiority in the region. So I think what we have to understand is that for states, especially large states, China and India and others, who, who want to be, want to become great powers on the global stage, increasingly under, understand that nuclear weapons are not in their interest. Nuclear weapons are becoming weapons of weak states and terrorist groups. Okay, let's yeah, This let's undoubtedly stay explains that. why both the Indians and the Pakistanis are building nuclear weapons. Okay, but Richard, and improving Richard, the means Richard of you were you you were quoted earlier this decade saying that an American president would never use nuclear weapons and neither would the Russians. Okay, I think then why are you so concerned about why are you so concerned about whether the United States and Russia possess them? Because I, I, I believe that unless the existing nuclear powers, not just simply the United States and Russia, but China and others, unless they engage in a serious effort to reduce and make the efforts to eliminate those weapons, we're going to be living in a world of 40 or 50 nuclear powers, and potentially, sooner or later, those weapons are going to are um, going to end up in the wrong hands. Ambassador Burt, though, do you think that your kind of message is actually striking a chord in Washington? Just tell you what Robert Gates, the U.S. Defense Secretary of State, has said a few months ago. Our nuclear arsenal is vital because you simply cannot predict the future. Who can tell what the world will look like in 10 to 20 years' time? You know very well when the Cold War ended, there were many people in Britain, the United Kingdom, who said, well, do we really need a, an external security service, MI6, because uh, we, you know, there's no Cold War anymore. People Look, didn't know me, about Al-Qaeda coming and all that. Let me be clear about this. Nobody is talking about scrapping our nuclear deterrent in, in 5, 10, or 15 years. And we don't know what the world will look sure. like uh, in 10 or 15 years. But uh, Secretary Gates serves in an administration which, uh, in which the president, who's the commander-in-chief, has outlined the long-run goal of, of nuclear elimination. And if you believe, if you can't predict the future, but believe we're going to see a continuing pr proliferation of these weapons, and you believe that as a result of that, sooner or later, they will be used in anger, then I think a serious effort to think through the problems of eliminating these weapons is certainly uh, long overdue. Yeah, but I should just clarify I, I think that Barack be... Obama said in April, make no mistake, as long as these weapons exist, the United States will maintain a safe, secure, and effective arsenal to deter any adversaries. So... And, and, and as Richard Pearl has said, and I agree with him, we have, we, we have many more weapons than we need now, and there is no right. reason why the United States and Russia can't agree this year on a new okay. follow-on treaty to start and begin negotiating further reductions with the, and we ought to, as part of that process, by the way, ask okay. the other existing nuclear states 
to agree to cap their forces. All right, Richard Pearl. Please freeze those forces in that second U.S.-Russia negotiation. Richard Pearl, I want to come to you now. Um, Ambassador Burt has talked about non-state actors, terror groups, individuals getting hold of nuclear weapons some way or the other. Barack Obama said recently a nuclear-armed terrorist is the most immediate and extreme threat to global security. So never mind about what nations and states do. That is the real threat. Well, it's a very real threat, of course, and uh, we worry a lot about uh, the possibility of nuclear weapons falling into the hands of uh, terrorist groups. Uh, I don't think you solve that problem by uh, a pie-in-the-sky scheme to reduce, to, to eliminate all nuclear weapons. I think you solve that problem, uh, or mitigate it, at least manage it, uh, uh, by combating the terrorist organizations and by trying to discourage uh, states from acquiring nuclear weapons that might be prepared to share them with terrorists, states like uh, Iran, for example. And uh, frankly, we are not going to halt the Iranian program by reducing our own weapons. The UN Atomic um, Energy Agency says that they're assured that Pakistan has its nuclear arsenal protected, but there are real concerns about the tensions, obviously, on the border between Pakistan and Afghanistan. I mean, is it possible that the likes of al-Qaeda could get their hands on nuclear material and use it? Well, al-Qaeda is in an alliance with the Taliban, and the Taliban is doing what it can to bring down uh, uh, the government of Pakistan, certainly to destabilize the country. It's a very dangerous situation, and uh, no, it's, it's, it's going to it, be a da dangerous situation for a long time to come. Ambassador Burt? Well, no, it's a very real danger. I mean, we are, uh, we are now witnessing a situation where Pakistan, under certain circumstances, could become a failed state. And, and in that situation, groups, not just al-Qaeda, but other, other militant groups uh, who have penetrated the Pakistani military or their intelligence services could acquire uh, nuclear weapons. It is, is indeed a very serious threat, and, it, and it's the kind of threat, not the threat of the sort of out-of-the-blue nuclear strike that we worried about in the Cold War that right. we need to address. A brief and I don't see any other way of doing it than by creating a situation where you All can right. bring these these nuclear powers into a multilateral Okay, you've made that point. A brief final point to both of you. Richard Pearl, Barack Obama awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, makes a nuclear free world less or more likely? I don't think it has any bearing on it uh, whatsoever. What it, what it's uh, damaged is not the prospect for nuclear disarmament, it's damaged the Nobel Prize in my view. Ambassador Richard Burt? Well, I think the Nobel Peace Prize was already damaged prior to it being awarded to uh, to President Obama. It was awarded, by the way, to a South, I mean, to a North Vietnamese uh, negotiator in the 1970s. Now, I think the key point here is that it, the United States alone cannot take uh, this decision. There needs to be a consensus by major governments around the world to take this goal seriously. I welcome the fact that the Russian leadership is embracing the goal, and I think uh, other countries now must be brought into the process, right. and I think the next country is China. Ambassador Richard Burt, Richard Pearl, gentlemen, thank you both there in Washington.